Good evening everyone and welcome to another of your spooky sessions with me your host Hedda Gold. Now I hope that you are all keeping well and it's now the start of the weekend so you know I just hope that everybody is planning on having the best weekend that they can possibly think of. You know, we all need to stretch our imaginations a lot these days and we just have to do the best with what we have. So tonight I'm going to bring you um, two stories. One is your opener. It is The Legend of Hawaii's Night Marches. So I'm going to be telling you about them. And then... We are going to be reading the penultimate of our first series of Restoration, episode four, because next week we reach the final, the finale, episode five. So the action is going to be picking up again tonight with episode four. I need to find out what Fred's going to do next. So, with all that being said, I'm going to ask you to please sit back, relax, while I read to you the story of the night marches of Hawaii. And I hope you, you enjoy it. While most ghost hunters are out looking for spirits, there are some ghosts you should never look at. Hawaii's night marches, the phantoms of ancient Hawaiian warriors, are said to roam the islands at night. In life, these warriors supposedly travelled at night to protect people so sacred that the common man was never allowed to look at them. Breaking that rule meant death. The night marcher's job wasn't to terrorise people. It was simply to protect the most sacred, high-ranking chiefs. I mean, depending on kapu status, the chiefs marched in front or behind the procession. The night marchers showed mercy by travelling at night to spare people from harm. The storyteller Lopaka Kapanui says. It's easy to tell if night marchers are approaching, he says. They carry torches. They march to the thunderous sound of drums. They give warning by sounding a conch shell. That's when you know it's time to run and hide. If you're already in the path of the night marchers' trail, Legend dictates you must strip naked and lie face down. There's a rumour that peeing on yourself will keep you alive. Whatever you decide to do, though, don't look at them. If you're lucky enough to share a bloodline with somebody marching in the procession, you'll supposedly be saved. The night marchers are said to frequent sacred Hawaiian grounds such as the sites of sacrificial temples and other areas of Oahu, including Yokohama Bay, Kamehameha III's summer mansion, Makaha Valley Plantation, Keina Point and Kalama Valley. There's even a night marcher's path that goes through the armory inside the Diamond Head Crater, Kapa Nui says. In downtown Honolulu, there's reportedly a night marcher's trail that runs through the footprint of the Davies Pacific Centre. Not the building, that is. In 2012, Kapa Nui met with attorneys on the 23rd floor, who claimed that the building's security cameras captured the night marchers on video. A native Hawaiian cleaning lady was reportedly doing a job at night, when a column of mist appeared. The woman died the next day. The 
following months, someone claimed to have seen the ghost of the lady marching with the night marchers and disappearing into the other side of the wall. The night marchers are said to march on the last four Hawaiian moon phases before the moon goes completely dark. This month, you know, in October, when Kapa Nui says the night marchers will appear, Kapa Nui recommends showing respect to the night marchers. Don't go looking for them. Yet sometimes you don't have to try looking for them. Ricky, a security guard at the Kadeshut building, claims he once saw, caught sight of the glimpse of night marchers during a brief, brief trip to Wailua some 19 years ago. Ricky and his then-girlfriend, Jennifer, visited their friend Richard and his son, Ryan, who were camping on Mokalea Beach. Ricky remembers the exact date, 5th of July, 1995. They arrived on the beach between 10 and 11 p.m. A distant flash of light caught their attention in the dark. It looked like a line of fire ants marching down the mountain by Dillingham Airfield. I thought people were hunting, but there was a long line of torches, he says. It was a strange sight at first because it looked like an endless line of torches disappearing off the mountain edge. But he later realised those weren't hunters, but night marchers. He recalls hearing the legend of the night marchers as a kid at the YMCA Camp Erdman. One staffer always used to warn the young campers about a night marcher's path in the same spot he saw them. Luckily, Ricky and his friends survived to tell the tale. But he hasn't been back to Mokailua since. I reckon he's probably just been hedging his bets. Don't you? So, as I've already said, my friend Amma lives in Hawaii. And... Um, I'm hoping that if she sees this, she might be able to shed some light on what she knows about the night marches. But if I ever went to Hawaii, or if ever any of you go to Hawaii, just be careful if you see a line of lights. Go in the other direction. Don't go looking for them. Just err on the side of caution. Right, so now it's time for restoration. Where were we last week? Well, Belial had caught up with Fred, had given him a good beating and told him that he was on the clock. That he had to bring him the um, sanguine amber. And that if he didn't, that Belial was going to murder Sandy, his wife, and then his two boys, Trevor and Colin. And then Fred turns up at the mansion to find it's just a complete wreck, a ruin, no marble, no St. Dinah, no anything. It's just an empty shell. And I would imagine he's just lost. You'll not know what to do. So Let's pick up from where we left off last week. And I really do hope that you enjoy this one. Right. I was panicked. I wasn't even sure what to do. 
Timothy was a don't ask customer. So I had no contact info saved, no way to reach him, not even a cell number. That's when I realised I did have some hope. I got back into the truck and hauled my ass into my office. I could get there in about 20 minutes. I could check the caller ID, maybe reach him that way. I zipped out of the long driveway and got moving as fast as possible, leaving the gate open. I don't even think I closed the doors to the old mansion. I got to the office in just under 15 minutes. I fumbled with the lock, having to stop myself for a second and then calmly get the key into the slot. I pulled the door open and rushed to my desk. I hit the call history on the phone and I finally got a number. Out of state, sure, it was from New York, which is fine and probably the right number. I hit the speed redial while jotting the number down. My stomach dropped when it directly went to voicemail and I heard the message on the other end. You've reached Major Timothy Crestfall. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you shortly. Godspeed. I hadn't caught my breath by this time the beep occurred. Timothy, please, you need to call me back. Belial's threatening my family, my wife, the kids. I gave them that water you gave me. But this guy, he's... I don't think... Should I say it out loud? To make it real? I don't think he's human. Help me. I hung up and tried to call again. Direct a voicemail once more. A random thought runs past my frantic mind. He's a bit young looking for an officer, right? My cell phone rings. It's a 1-800 number of some sort. Calling me in the middle of the night. I was about to ignore it, but something told me I shouldn't. I answer the phone. This is Fred. Who's this? There's a crackle on the other line. I think I hear something like a scream before it cuts out entirely. A young man is on the line and he sounds shaken. Sir, are you Mr. Fred Macayon? Yes, who's this? This is your home alarm central monitoring, sir. We're getting alerts that multiple smoke detectors have alarmed in the home. We've contacted the fire department, but we're not able to reach anyone in the house via the front panel. Are you at home at the moment? I feel a little dizzy, but I stand up regardless and make my way to my car. Oh, God, have you tried my wife's cell? Yes, sir. We've attempted multiple times. Are you home? No, no, I'm not at home. The fire department's on its way, sir. Do you need me to stay on the line with you? No, I'm going home. I jump out of the office, leaving it unlocked, and I get into the truck. At this point, I don't give a single solitary fuck about speed limits. I'm flooring it. I'm not even paying attention to the speedometer until I look at my rear view and I see police lights. I pull over, shaking, not even sure what's going on, what's happening with my family. I keep thinking that they're going to be safe, that I gave that holy water stuff to them. They have to be alive. Well, because of that, Chavez called it God's blessing. I tap against my window and I roll it down quickly. The cop is gruff looking, heavy set, black guy. In a hurry? My voice cracks. I try to compose myself. Officer, I got a message from my alarm company. There's smoke alarms going off at my house. I've got about 20 minutes to get there. I need a pass on this. The officer puts his hand out. License, sir? I curse and hand him my license, and I hear him actually running to his car. I contemplate just speeding off right then and there. Scenarios going through my head of him shooting at tyres or turning the entire thing into a police chase. My train of thought is broken when he runs back to my window, giving me my licence. Follow me, try to keep up, sir. What? 
I'm confused by this. I'm giving you an escort. I think I went pale at this point. The cop puts his hand on my shoulder. Sir, do you need me to give you a lift? I look to my shaking hands and just nod dumbly. He opens my truck door, takes out the keys and undoes the seatbelt. Before I know what's going on, I'm in his squad car and we're speeding down the streets with the sirens blaring. I hear the radio chatter come in and out, but I can barely understand it. He grabs his radio. Car 314, got a resident of 335 Locust Street, en route to the scene. The scene? I'm still in disbelief. Shock. Can barely tell we're on my street. The car finally slows down after it was done running every red light and every stop sign. The car comes to a stop and I scramble out the car. I'm half blinded by the sea of emergency vehicles, ambulance, fire, other cop cars. I think briefly, well that at least the alarm system did something after 10 years of a monthly subscription. The heavyset officer is already out and parting the onlookers in front of me, stepping past the caution tape. He says something to the other officers as I wander onto my front lawn. I stagger onto the lawn to see the smouldering remains of my home. Firefighters are working to put out one of the fires. I look around frantically, trying to spot Sandy and the boys. I eventually find them. Three body bags are on the lawn, sealed. Two smaller forms inside, and another that reminds me of my wife and she would hide under the sheets. I feel pain in my knees suddenly. Partly I fell at seeing them. I feel a pair of hands on my shoulders, another rough handling my arms and hefting me up. My legs barely function as I'm led to the back of an ambulance. The heavyset officer helps me sit down in the back of the ambulance. Through all the white noise, I see a very bright light in my face and a voice slowly, finally comes through. Can you hear me, sir? The young black woman is in front of me with an ophthalmoscope. I blink, finally shaking my head. Yeah. She moves the bright light back and forth and I start to come out my funk. I looked at the pavement. They didn't make it out, did they? Our tone is empathetic, but practised. I'm sorry, no. We did everything we could, but by the time the fire department was even able to reach them, it was too late. I do my best not just to burst into tears, but they come anyway. I suppress a sob. And I try to swallow it down. I blink a few tears out of my eyes. And I hear the female EMT walk away. I hear a few male voices approach her. This him? Okay, I've got it from here. You can call fall back. Might get ugly, you know. I shake my head, knocking a few tears out. Cops are going to be asking questions and I need to be composed. I try to dry my eyes, but it doesn't work. I feel the ambulance shift slightly as someone sits next to me. Mr. Macayon? I nod, eyes still downcast. I'm Detective Benjamin Liebel, with a few questions to ask, mostly regarding your whereabouts prior to the fire. Smoke? A packet of cigarettes is offered. I take one. I accept the light and take a deep breath. I'm about to say something when I think about how odd that name sounds. I hear a wheezing snicker and the voice changes to one I'm too familiar with. I'm kidding, Freddy. I know where you were. My head snaps to my left and I see Belial. He's sitting right next to me. 
black hair slicked back above his pale face, yellow eyes and two white teeth. His dust is still white, but in addition to the red tie, he has a police ID badge hanging round his neck. I clench my fist, grit my teeth, but before I can stand and deck him in his perfect teeth, his hand is on my fist and he's hushing me, pulling my hand down. Shush, he starts. I was just delivering on a promise, Red Fred. I try to push against his hand, but it doesn't budge. Stop calling me that. We can call you that, Red Fred. You should get used to that. We all call you it. His grin fades. But I have to give you some kudos, Freddy. That was a dirty trick. What the hell are you on about? His grin seems to return somewhat. Oh, and I couldn't pull you towards me. I assumed you'd drunk some of the sanctified water from the Guardian Temple. Guardian Temple? Bilal snickers almost hissing. The place you were cleaning, Freddy. He takes a deep breath, wheezing out his next words. As I said, you surprised me. Giving your only protection against me to your family. Smarter than I took you for. I glared daggers at him, even with tears in my eyes. This seems to make me even happier. You see, Fred, normally what I would have done would have been to march up to your children's bedroom, wake them up, and then take them to mummy, and then torture her relentlessly until she forsakes you and the children, and then promise her an end to our pain in exchange for our soul. A chill runs down my spine. The strong ones resist, right up until I threaten to put the children through the same pain I'm putting her through. He's grinning a sick grin from ear to ear. Then I take our soul in exchange for the safety of our children. Once that's mine, I remove the love she holds for our family, for God, make her one of my whores, and then she'd usually just kill the kids on her own. He lights his own cigarette. You know, for fun. I can feel the horror just wash over me. It's almost without fail worked for at least nine out of ten. I try to swallow the lump in my throat. But you, Fred, and his grin fades at this point, you robbed me of a good time. You see, normally if you drink half a bottle of that holy water, you're protected from possession and the like. But what you did, Fred, giving the um, your protection selflessly, that bumped the potency up something fierce. He shows me his left hand, the skin on his palm is entirely black, his hands shriveled and shaken. One of his rings even falls off his finger and shatters when it hits the ground. He curses in some unknown guttural language as this happens. You see, Fred, that happened when I reached out and grabbed your wife's arm. Burned like a bitch. Still feel it burning, actually. He now glares at me. The yellow in his eyes seems to be moving. So, with me being unable to touch them, I had to take some more mundane methods of moving and keep my promise. He pulls his hand away and slides a leather glove over it. Broke the doorknobs, nailed a few windows down, made sure they didn't get out as I burned the place down from bottom to top. He snickers. You protected your family from me, but the house was a different story. I'm gritting my teeth, staring daggers at Belial, as he seems to be enjoying telling me all of this. His tone changes, however. I've never had to end someone like that. So mundane. 
so dull. And knowing that their souls were saved as I did it. Smoke spews from his nostrils as he huffs and wheezes. One nasty taste to leave my mouth Fred. He stands up. But you've been through enough today. I'll let you live for now. Belial turns to me. Unless you want me to make it easier on everyone. And just, you know. He slides a finger across his throat. Might be nice to do something ironic, you know. There's a tyre swing in the backyard. You could hang yourself from it. As he speaks, I feel kind of woozy and confused. Maybe at the motel? Take the hairdryer and take a shower with it? I shake my head. It feels like someone's shoving cotton in my ears. And I can only hear his voice over the background noises. His breath is on my ear now. When you think about it, what sort of man can't even protect his own family? The only honourable way is to remove yourself from the equation. Suddenly he's gone and I can think clearly again. The EMT is back and she starts taking my vitals. I'm gazing up at the night sky and I've got no idea what I'm going to do. The next week goes by like I'm a passenger in my own body. I work out details with funeral directors and lawyers and insurance companies. I get tired of hearing the words, sorry for your loss. I'm bouncing between absolute sorrow and blinding anger. I can't control which family members I snap at or sob in front of. By the time the funeral day comes, it's me and a few friends and family on my wife's side. I'm in a church the first time in years, and the organ is playing a sad old dirge while I sit at one of the front pews alone. My family wants little to do with me. Half of them think I burned the house down for it in a triple homicide. The news was leaked somehow about how the windows were nailed shut and the doorknobs were removed before being locked. So I'm pretty shocked when someone in a rather nice suit and some pretty powerful cologne sits next to me. We only just heard... A pretty thick Latin accent chimes in, but a pretty familiar one. I look up to see Chavez, of all people, sitting next to me. He's wearing a pretty expensive tailored suit. Chavez? He points to a necklace of some kind round his neck. Temple charm helps you understand me even when we're outside of it. I sit up, looking him over extremely confused. Why are you here? I narrow my eyes. And where the fuck is Timothy? Travis frowns. He's here. But I told him not to come to you yet. I know you blame him for this. No shit, Travis. I look round the church before Travis puts his hand on my shoulder. Where is he? Travis shakes his head. Now isn't the time, Fred. I now glare at Travis. So what? You're as lucky now? I stare ahead at the three caskets, all closed before me. What the hell is he? Not what we both thought, is all Travis said. We are both quiet for some time before Travis decides to piss me off. I know how you feel. Fuck you, Chavez. I glare at him. I'm out of tears at this point. I'm just in, in an angry mood right now. You know how I feel? Sandy and the boys didn't deserve this. She was an amazing woman. The boys were good kids. They didn't deserve this. And it's because of me getting mixed up with Timothy's bullshit temple 
or whatever it was. So don't give me the I know how you feel nonsense. You don't have a fucking clue. Chavez is silent as he looks ahead at the caskets. When I was in Honduras, I helped the cartel smuggle drugs past the border. I would build chairs, tables, and the like. I'd hide the coke in them, and I made the trapdoors. One day, my trapdoors all started to get found out. And one day, the cartel comes to me, and they tell me they're going to try something new. They want me to make the crucifixes and hide the drugs there. They tell me the drugs won't be found as easy because people won't check the crucifixes. He makes a sign of the cross over his heart. I refuse. I tell them I'm going to leave. I promise not to tell the police. Then I tell them I'm done. He turns to me, hands now clasped in his lap. The next day, I wake up with a bag on my head. And I think they're going to kill me. You know? I make my peace with God. And I accept my fate. Well, they bring me to a river. And along with it, they have my mother, father, my wife, my daughter, all lined up. It's normally happy face turns mournful. They don't even give me a choice. They execute my family in front of me. They throw them into the river. They tell me, you live for the cartel, or you die for the cartel. I just look away at this point. Chavez leans back in the pew, now looking at me. You get to bury your family, Fred. Be happy for that. I'll never have that right. It was taken from me. I turned to him. His story is probably worse than my own. Not that I'm weighing regard tragedies or anything. Chavez, I ask. You never answered me. Why are you even here right now? Chavez looks around as if searching for someone. Fred, you always help me out. You gave me a job. Gave me a ride to my place when I needed it. Chavez gives me a sympathetic smile. I'm here because I'm your friend. As a man, I usually leave crying for the macho stuff. Grand Canyon and the funerals. I guess this was an exception though. Of all the people who would show up when I needed it. If you told me it would be a Jorge Chavez... The illegal immigrant who's the best guy I know with a sandblaster. I'd never have believed you. Now I'm sobbing next to the guy and he's doing his best to comfort me. Chavez even volunteers to be a pole bearer at the end of the ceremony. At the graveyard, he's the last one to stand with me. I turn to him as I'm still swinging between deep depression and seething anger. Chavez, how can you still believe in God? He took everything from you and yet you're still faithful? Chavez starts to unbutton his shirt, his jacket, as he talks. When the cartel killed my family, they forced me to be their runner. He undoes his jacket. And now is undoing some buttons on his shirt. One day, during a drop, I see a hole in the border fence to America. I think to myself, I can live in the cartel or die free. I prayed to God and asked him to protect me during my escape. I ran. He reveals his chest. There's a hole just below his rib cage. On the right, looks like a bullet wound. It missed my heart, lungs, and didn't even hit a bone. A one in a million shot. A miracle, Fred. 
God's protection. That's why we should thank him every day. He said while tapping the skull. Thank him. Chavez, where was he when Sandy and the boys needed help? Where was God? Why didn't he help them? Chavez looks me dead in the eyes as he buttons up his shirt. Did you ask him to help, Fred? I'm silent and just stare ahead of me, past the graves. It can't possibly be that simple, I tell myself. That whole asking you shall receive nonsense. After a while, Chavez leaves my side. A few minutes later, I hear someone walking up behind me. I look, still facing ahead, and I see Timothy in a black trench coat and suit with black tie behind me. You've got balls, man, I say curtly. I never intended for this, Timothy says plainly. He looks over the graves. What you did to protect them was... Well, it was beyond what I thought you could do. He had started to smile a bit, but now his smile fades. If I'd known you had a family, I'd have given you some other tools. I turn and march right up to him. Despite this, he doesn't flinch as I get in his face. Yeah, your tools were really fucking useful. I gave my wife and the boys that sacred water, and it just gave them a quicker death. It saved the souls, Fred, Timothy says simply. Because of you, your wife's soul isn't in the possession of Belial. Neither are your children. Bullshit! I shout. That's not how that shit works. You don't lose your soul if a demon possesses you. Sometimes you die, but I know enough about that shit to know you're just bullshitting me. I talk to the fucking priests. You think Belial is a demon? I take a step back. What else could he be? Timothy's face doesn't change expression in the least. Belial was first a dark angel, long ago. He was tasked with punishing impure souls. That was before the war. Timothy looks to the sky. I look up with him. What war? The war of the cherubim and the seraphim. The cherubim were high order angels, created by God to be his servants, but who aligned themselves with Lucifer. Timothy looks to me. The war began when Belial talked Lucifer into defying God in the first place. I'm pretty dumbfounded at this point. I looked to the grace of my family for a moment. Why does such a big shot from down below want to fuck with me then? The amber you spoke of. It has enormous power. Power enough where, if Belial got his hands on it, He'd be able to pull himself into this world, Timothy answers. Pull himself? News flash, Timothy. He's already here. Timothy shakes his head slowly. Belial's only possessing a man now. That's why the first day he didn't kill you and take the amber. The man he possessed was still resisting him, still fighting. At that stage of early possession... A spirit can't make someone do something they don't want to. It wasn't till the next day his will faltered and Belial gained full control. Still, even in full control, only a wisp of his power can get through that vessel. Timothy gives an odd smile to me. Belial, with the amber, would have brought himself into this world completely and as a full-powered cherubim laid waste to everything. Now he beamed at me. So, Fred, you saved the world by keeping it from him. I looked away from Timothy, not knowing how to feel about that. It only cost my family's lives. The souls are safe. And Belial's still out there. 
He's still going to fuck with me, isn't he? I imagine he's none too pleased that you protected your family from him. He'll likely continue to torment you. Plan on doing anything about it? I glare at the graves. Or am I going to get a spot next to Sandy here as my protection? Do you plan on asking? I turn and face him. Please, Timothy, fucking help me get rid of this thing. Don't ask me. Timothy turns away from me and starts walking away. Who the hell do I ask then? I shout. Timothy ignores me and continues to walk away. I turn to face the graves again and I get the hint. I look around and clear my throat. Hey, God, mind giving me a hand here? Travis's hand is on my shoulder suddenly. Do you know how to ask for it? I shake my head and Chavez just smiles. I'll show you. He gets on his knees and starts. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I slowly get to my knees and repeat. Chavez whispers next to me. Now ask and end with, Amen. Chavez then gets up and leaves. I'm still on my knees feeling rather awkward, but I just continue. God, I know I'm kind of a stranger these days, but I need help. This Belial guy, he's killed my family. I need justice. Help me get rid of him. I hope that's enough and then finish. Amen. Suddenly I hear a deep voice above me. Fred Macayon? I look up, seeing only the silhouette of a male figure above me. God? I was suddenly pulled up onto my feet, and I see several officers, as well as the detective who said my name. The guy looks like an off-season weightlifter who's been shoved into a detective's uniform. The black officer's head is bald, and his voice is deeper than I'm used to hearing. Never been called God before, but... For you, I may as well be. You're under arrest for suspected murder, arson, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. Great. I say out loud as they cuff me. Hey, watch it. As I'm led away from the grace of my family, I spot him. Clad in his usual white duster and red tie, wearing the police badge again. The black detective yells at him. Hey, Ben, we got our collar. You were right. He did hang around here longer than everyone else. Belial smiles as he greets his fellow officer. Good work, then. He speaks in his false human voice. Didn't think he'd be hard. He left a shitload of evidence behind. He smiles at me. We're going to have fun with you. Thanks, God. I think to myself as I'm shoved into a squad car. I look out of the window as I see a black detective walk away from Belial, and then Timothy comes out from behind a tree nearby. Timothy stares Belial down, and Belial turns to face him. They contrast each other oddly, Timothy in his black trench coat and Belial in white. Not the right match-up, I think. They say a few things to each other, though I really can't hear too well. Leave is what I can make out from Timothy. Belial seems to laugh, but I can't hear what he's saying. Watching his lips, it looks like he says, Mother, at some point. Timothy seems to narrow his eyes and get serious. Kick his ass, Timothy. I think to myself, 
as I watch with bated breath as the two square off in the graveyard. Timothy seems calm and collected. Belial is grinning from ear to ear. I look back and forth between the two, and my heart skipped a beat with what happened next. Belial makes a sudden step towards Timothy in a rapping, jerking motion, and then falls back to where he was. Timothy flinches, causing Belial to laugh, before turning away and walking back to an unmarked car with the other detective. Oh, great, I think to myself. My guardian angel is a pussy. And that, my friends, is the end of part four. So next Friday is part five. It is a longer than usual episode. So if you want me to put in a short ghost story beforehand, as I always do, then please let me know. If you'd rather I just stop to the the story of restoration also please let me know you know I can't just do what I want to do this is for your entertainment as well so but you know what did you think of tonight's episode did you like it how are you feeling about what's happened to Fred's family? Don't you just want to do something rather evil to Belial? If that's possible to do, do something evil to someone who's already the living embodiment of evil. It's a hard one and no mistake. Anyway... I hope you did enjoy this one and I must admit I quite enjoyed it but then again I've been reading it and rereading it now for the last month and I always find something new every time you know I read an episode I don't know why it is because I must have read it Oh my goodness, must have been months and months ago. Well, before the lockdown. Probably before Christmas. Um, but there's always more to remember, you know. And it's really, really entertaining. Zathero has done an extremely good job. So... And I want to thank you very, very much for being here. And I want to thank you very much for watching and for listening to me telling the story tonight. Like I said, I do hope that you enjoyed it. And please let me know what you think about it in the comments. It's always nice to get some feedback as to what you think about the stories I put up for you. And I do hope that wherever you are in the world, you have the best weekend you could possibly have. I really do mean that. Because we all deserve to have something nice. And it's always nice to have something to look forward to. So with all that being said, I would like to wish you all a wonderful weekend. And I want to wish you, whatever time of day it is, morning, afternoon, evening, night time. I hope it's a good one for you. I do love you all. Please take care of yourselves. And I will see you all again very, very soon. So until then, 
I would like to wish you a very, very good night. Very, very good good night as well. Good night. <laughs>